I was uh, seem to be having uh, a little bit of trouble connecting. Anyway, so welcome everybody. Thank you very much um, for for joining um, us today. This is the first Wednesday in September, so September the seventh. And as you know, every first Wednesday of every month, we we have um, a webinar as part of the uh, as part of the GoGN. Um, so so just for everybody to to, to Take note, um, the webinar is being recorded and will be shared publicly uh, once, we, once we're done. So that means that um, anything you share, so any comments you write on the, on the chat, will be shared publicly uh, as well. So just a quick introduction about the GoGN, just in case you don't know who we are. So the GoGN is the Global OER Graduate Network. And it's a network of PhD researchers around the world who are conducting research uh, with a focus on 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 an aspect of, of openness, open educational resources, of open education. Um, so the goal of the GoGN is to raise the profile of research into open educational resources, open education, and also to offer support to those conducting. Um, research in, in, in this area. So, um, what we do? So, I'm I'm very very happy to that that Chironica has has agreed to to be here with us and present her work. So, uh, Chironica is a professor of um, educational technology at the the OU uh, of um, the OU University of, of Sri Lanka, and uh, she's going to be talking about a study that she's been conducting uh, together with her team as part of the Roar for D project. Um, uh, what we're going to do is this: the normal setup is like what we're going to do is Shironika is going to speak for 20, 30 minutes, and then if you have any questions, we'll take them at the end. So, you know, feel free to, to use the chat for your questions, but we're going to wait until the end so it's easier, you know, instead of interrupt, interrupting uh, Shironika. Um, so that's all for me. Uh, Shironika, it's over to you. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Lee, for the introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be sharing my experiences. Uh, that uh, about research we are conducting currently in the Open University of Sri Lanka. Um, okay, this uh, research uh, is uh, part of the Row for the Project Impact Studies. Uh, I'm sure uh, you all have heard about this Row for the Project. So uh, we started this project in 2015 March. Now we have completed the project and in the final stages of uh, data analysis and writing the report. Uh, so what I'm going to share with you today, uh, mainly about the, uh, the research, the methodology we have used, the strategies, data collection strategies and, and data analysis, and some preliminary findings. And we uh, will your feedback and any, any comments or any questions you might have answering any questions. So that's how I plan to do today my presentation. Okay. Uh, so uh, this. This research uh, is uh, conducted by a team of us, uh, 14 of us actually. Uh, so me, only researcher, Dr. National in Australia, and uh, 12 other colleagues from the Open Institute of Sri Lanka. We are all from Faculty of Education. So uh, just a little bit of context. Uh, Sri Lanka, as you know, is a small island, tiny dot in the world map. Uh, so, uh, OER is a novel concept still in the school education system. Uh, the Open Institute of Sri Lanka is the premier OGL institution. So, uh, 
taken certain initiatives in well promoting raising awareness about Korea and promoting Korea, especially at the Faculty of Education. We are, we are conducting this uh, professional development program for teachers. So this program, uh, this project itself is dealing with uh, the post diploma in education program. We are, uh, which we are conducting to the teachers, school uh, teachers, all over the country. Because we have centers all over the country, as you can see from the map. There yeah, are there's yeah, there's open open centers situated all over the country. So we targeted at engaging student teachers of uh, nine provinces of the country. Uh, and uh, well, uh, integrating uh, how uh, the impact of integrating OER in that learning process. Uh, as this was a novel uh, concept, so, so uh, with the method of it will be difficult, I will talk about that later. The focus, the main focus, is uh, stating the impact of OER integration in teaching and learning upon three aspects that, that is changes in the quality of teaching that materials teachers use, their pedagogical, pedagogical perspective, and their pedagogical practices. So uh, basically, this is what teachers, uh, teachers are doing in their day-to-day -day teaching learning and their teaching practices. So uh, our research questions are based on that. How and in which way the inclusion of OER is having an impact on their teaching learning process. Now, the key word here is changes. So, the impact we are uh, looking at from the point of view of changes. So, the our concept of change is based on the theory of change. Theory of change. So I just uh, gave this little bit of background. I'm not going to go into details about this. Uh, but what I want to highlight here is our main focus on uh, this uh, last bullet here, that adoption of OER by educators will be truly effective only if it is a change in their thinking and their actions. So thinking, that is what we uh, all about, talk about pedagogical beliefs and actions, the pedagogical practices. Okay, now uh, our design, I'm going to talk about the methodology. Now, uh, the, since our focus is mainly on practices of teachers, we uh, were thinking about suitable methodology. We selected this design, the design based research approach. That is DBR, we call it DBR, which aims at improving education practices when it comes to the process. So I just uh, would like to uh, go through the procedure. Because, because our whole methodology was designed based on the AR approach. Now, why we selected this DDR approach? Which, before going to the details, I would like to tell you uh, why we selected this approach. Because uh, this open concept, uh, as we know, OER, gives access yes, to resources access to students, to but rather than just access, we want we to want see to how the teachers are going to use OER or integrate them in their teaching learning practices. So uh, this is uh, 
Okay. Like any other resource, uh, OER also is another educational resource. So how to? Hello. Hello. Okay. Okay. Some some problem with connection. I just uh, sorry. Okay. Anyway, what I was uh, trying to tell was why we selected the DBR approach. Because we were focusing more on these practices, change in their practices, uh, the DBR approach where the researchers and practitioners collaboratively work on improving practices. Now, if we go through the four stages, first part is analyzing the current situation. What are what the practical problems? And it's a collaborative analysis by the researchers and practitioners, practitioners together. So I will tell how we deal, deal with that in our methodology. Then after analyzing the situation, developing solutions informed by existing design principles. Then cycles of testing and refinement of these solutions. And then reflecting on producing design principles. So that's the basic, basic four steps in the DBR approach. Now, how we how we, uh, how we uh, attempted this in our methodology? As you can see, this uh, is a formative sort of uh, process where refinement of practice is happening where researchers and practitioners are working together as co-participants. And the key thing here is the researchers play a dual role, not only as researchers, but as designers of the whole process. Now, why we had to design a process? Because this is focusing on improving practices. Now, in order to improve practices, there has to be a very carefully structured design. So that's what we did in our methodology using the DBR approach. We designed a, an intervention. We designed an intervention, which is a professional development program on OER integration. For this purpose, we selected 230 student teachers of our postgraduate diploma in education program. And they were from all over the country, representing the nine provinces of the country, and also representing the different ethnicities and medium of study. That is in Sri Lanka, with uh, the in school, school system, children are taught in uh, two. Uh, Lang mainly two languages, Sinhala and Tamil. In addition to that, English also used, but mainly Sinhala and Tamil are the local languages, two national languages that are being used. Okay, so um, the intervention happened in this way uh, because OER was a novel concept for the teachers. Initially, it was a requirement to introduce them the concept. So uh, there were a, there was okay series of workshops were there. The first workshop, intervention workshop, was a capacity building workshop where the OER concept was introduced, and they were given hands-on experiences in identifying OER, searching for them. Uh, and then uh, selecting them and then integrating them in their teaching learning plans. So we held these workshops throughout the country. And that, that's one part of the intervention. The other part is giving them online support through an online learning environment with the Moodle learning management system. Because we, they are from all over the country, we are not meeting them regularly. So we designed this online learning environment uh, where they uh, they were given guidelines 
the lot of resources on the concept of OER, and also uh, we structured it in a way that it's uh, similar to their school syllabus. We selected subjects they are teaching, and to support them to find OER, we gave links to OER repositories relevant to their subject areas. And uh, also we gave them opportunities to search OER and upload them to share with their colleagues. There were links given for them to share OER. And also we encourage them to integrate OER in their lesson plans. Our teachers, they are preparing lesson plans. So uh, we ask them to uh, upload the lesson plans with OER integration so that everybody can see that and sharing with each other. Uh, and the other thing is we also encourage them to create their own OER as well and upload them in their limits, again sharing with everybody. So I am just uh, briefly telling uh, there were a lot more things happening in their limits and we have been, we are, we are, we have been continuously communicating with them. Uh, so these are the two main aspects of the intervention, the series of workshops and the online environment. Now during uh, these uh, series of workshops and the online learning, uh, online environment, we have been collecting data from multiple sources. That is the strategies involved in this process they also served as data collection strategies. Now, for example, uh, during the workshop, we had questionnaire surveys. Now, if I link that with the DBR process, the analysis part, we had to analyze the current situation. That is, the three aspects we want to focus on how, uh, what are the teaching learning materials they are currently using, what are their current thinking about resource use, and what are their current practices. So we use questionnaire surveys to look at their perspectives and practices. And also we use checklists uh, where uh, we analyze their lesson plans, what they are currently uh, planning, their lesson plans, and also some classroom observations to see how it's happening because they are our student teachers. So we could go for their classroom observations. Then another strategy we used was concept maps. I will come to that later. That was very interesting because uh, we wanted to see how they map out their understandings uh, as they go through this process. So a series of concept maps were developed during the process. Then semi-structured interviews with focus groups as well as individuals. And self-reflections, we encourage them to write their reflections while they go through the process. And finally, by the end of the process, uh, we compile stories. We call them stories uh, of their journey. Uh, we, uh, we compiled case studies as researchers and we uh, got the teachers to compile their stories because this was a collaborative process between uh, both parties, the researchers and the uh, teachers. And another thing we have been, we are, we are developing this impact OEP, impact evaluation index, that is open educational practices. Now, now you, I think you would realize we are focusing more on these practices, open educational practices, and how to evaluate its impact. We are developing this index. I will uh, come to that later uh, in, uh, after discussing some more things. So this methodological triangulation using a variety of methods was uh, to enhance the analysis and to establish trigger uh, in this uh, very complex situation. 
Okay, so these are some pictures that, uh, to show how we uh, collected this uh, data in using different things, concept mapping and integration of OER, focus group interviews and so on. So this happened in all nine centers, all nine provinces with these student teachers of ours. And data analysis, now, so we use both quantitative and qualitative data. Quantitative data is basically the surveys, uh, but mostly the, all the other uh, data were qualitative in nature. So here we use this IPA, or Interpretive Phenomenological Analysis, as a construct to analyze this qualitative data where we were using this coding, categorization, and interpretation of the content, the content analysis of the concept maps, narratives, their reflections, interview transcripts, and all this qualitative data. Uh, the idea of doing this to discover the meanings of the experiences of these individuals and through participants and researchers' interpretations, because this was a collaborative process and to examining their lived experiences because this was happening in a naturalistic environment so while the process was happening this analysis, analysis also was intertwined with the process uh, okay uh, there, there's a link I have given here later on if you uh, want more details about uh, our methodology I have given here a link. Now I will come to some preliminary findings. Uh, this is about the participant profile. Uh, now as you can see, uh, the, it considered more females because in the teaching profession, usually more female teachers are there. Uh, and they are all graduate teachers. Uh, uh, but interestingly, uh, this uh, majority were with less lesser number of uh, teaching experience. Uh, uh, actually, this was a convenience. Uh, we could call this a convenient sam sampler because we selected our own uh, student teachers. But we didn't force all of them. We just sent out the questionnaire for all students, and it was like on a voluntary basis who wanted to join. So it's interesting to see uh, most of them were with uh, lesser number of uh, teaching experiences and about the OER term, 9% have not even heard the term, they heard the term before. Okay, then uh, about the instructional materials they have been using before the intervention. We could see, you can, uh, that was uh, done based on a five point Likert scale. It's not at all. Not, uh, so you could see, uh, you can see the print material seems to be the most used one, most popular uh, type of instructional material used by teachers at that time. And OER. Uh, very limited and even online and multimedia to a lower extent. Uh, then we also uh, thought about uh, asking them what are the features they considered when they select instructional resources. Uh, so it's very interesting to see. Now you can see this. Uh, this. Uh, Columns uh, with the highest uh, averages, see about the relevance, being informative, reliability, freely accessible, reusable, cost efficiency, and so on. This particular one was the with the um, lo uh, lowest uh, concern. That is about the copyright being copyrighted. So that I, we thought that an interesting because they were not very much concerned about about whether the material is copyrighted or not when they were selecting the instructional resources. All this was before the intervention, pre-intervention data. And also about their uh, lesson plans, 
this these are aggregated results uh, although they were using mostly learner centered approaches activities and all when when we uh, looked at the instructional resource used uh, we couldn't see that they were used uh, use of variety of learning materials, learning media type, we couldn't see that. That was very low. And use of technology was very low. Uh, and opportunities for learner creativity, linking with real life situations. Uh, so these aspects uh, rate, were rated very low when we uh, analyzed their lesson plans. So it seems they were mostly depending on the textbooks that are provided by the government for the teachers, the textbooks, and the teacher guides. Other than that, uh, well, the, this creative uh, and innovative ways of thinking, it was very limited uh, to observe in their lesson plans. And uh, also about their perceptions about sharing. Uh, that was very interesting because you could see a large number of about 90 percent of them that they are sh already sharing materials whatever materials they are using they are sharing with the others and even what they are developing they are sharing with the others as well however there were certain concerns mentioned by them okay uh, even though it's uh, they they think it's good to share resources developed by others have a concerns about the quality, accuracy, relevance, and you need to modify them, and such concerns are there. And also about sharing resources, what they have developed, sharing them with the others, even though they feel it's good, it will help the others and all, again there are concerns about the ownership. Uh, how to protect ownership, maintaining identity, others may not realize the intended purpose and so on. Okay, so these are, these are all secondary level teachers that is from grade 6 to uh, 11. Up to O level, grade 6 to uh, O level grade te teachers teaching uh, in that uh, level. Then uh, when the OER was introduced for the first time, then they uh, were very interested in that concept. They said, now I can use information legally. I can use free data with permission. So now they said they were using these materials, thinking about copyrights all this time. But now they are thinking uh, about using the materials in a more legal manner and uh, after six months like mid intervention time we could see this is an online uh, questionnaire we asked about their use of oer we could see significant increase in the use of oer not only use but also about revising that is the four R's, uh, reuse, remix, revising, and redistributing, redistributing also. We could see it's gradually increasing. So, uh, their perceptions uh, by mid intervention. Now they saw that they could easily find information in a variety of formats, but still there were concerns because there were challenges. Mainly the facilities not being available at schools, the technology, the internet connectivity, the problems, and also language problem. Now, as I mentioned earlier, they are teaching in local languages. The resources are in English. Most resources are in English. So they couldn't find. So when uh, the language was a problem for them, when you are teaching in the local language, then uh, to search for uh, the materials in English. Uh, but even some who were interested in searching, they said they couldn't find the relevant materials they were looking for. But then again, they said maybe you. 
we need more experience in developing the skills to search and find the OER. So this is by mid-intervention. But after some time, you could see now they were trying to uh, find OER and then change it according to their needs. According to the needs of the children and edit it according to their lesson. That is revising and modifying it into local languages, actually translating. They started translating them into the two local languages and also trying to remix. Now, I think this is important part that we can see uh, gradually they have come up to this stage. Now, when they knew there's permission for them to do all these things, they started doing this. So that's the change of practice we observe by the end of the intervention. Earlier, they were just using without thinking about copyright. But now they understood the four arts and the Creative Commons license, and they uh, try. They were searching for materials with the Creative Commons license, looking at the permissions that that were given, and then use it in the way they wanted. It. I mean, according to their needs and according to the context. So this is uh, one uh, change in their practice we have observed and trying to remix also. Okay, now uh, that's the, that part was about uh, some summary of findings user survey. Uh, now uh, another uh, as strategy we used was concept mapping. That is mainly to see the changes happening in the uh, perceptions or their thinking. Because we thought uh, the, this concept mapping is a good strategy to uh, see how their thinking change. So at pre-intervention, we asked them to create a concept map, what they think about openness in education. So during the, uh, see, uh, the intervention, they created a series of concept maps, three or four concept maps. So we can see the we could see the gradual development of the concept, mainly uh, from a simple level to a concept uh, complex concept uh, where there were smaller number of concepts and larger number of concepts. That's a very simple way. We were thinking how to analyze this in a more um, structured way. Then we use this. Uh, model where structural analysis of concept maps are done based on this Kinchin et al. Uh, method using chains, spokes and networks. So where we categorize them to simple and complex chains that's like the flow chart concept leading from one to other very simple linear sort of flow of concepts. And the second level was spokes where uh, concepts uh, would, uh, okay, if I go back to my previous slide, I can explain it, okay, I think. Okay, now this would be a more linear type of thing. See? But this is like a spoke from one concept, several other concepts uh, radiating from the main concept. So starting from a linear sort of mapping, moving to a more uh, complex type of uh, concept map. And the other one was network one. That's where, in, uh, relate. now these, uh, if you are familiar with concept mapping, these are concepts and uh, relationships between the concepts. Now when there are interrelationships, it becomes like a net. So uh, that's what the third type was. Next, so we did a very thorough analysis of it, and I have a link to that study. We have presented a paper on that, and the set of slides is given there for those who are interested in that uh, strategy. That is, that strategy was to the structural analysis of concept map. We could see how their 
concepts were developing. The other one was content analysis. Systematic coding and categorizing of words and phrases. Again to see how their thinking is being developed. Okay, so details are there uh, in this uh, slide, uh, the link I have given. Uh, and I can uh, answer any questions later on if you want to know more details. Okay, this is other instrument I talked before. Uh, I think this is uh, something unique uh, output uh, that is uh, happening in our research. That is OEP, Open Education Practice Impact Evaluation Index. Now here uh, we are trying to capture the, the teachers' beliefs and practices again around open education practices over time, how it changes. Now this includes in different sections, this is one part of it, statement where they strongly agree up to strongly disagree. So at one point of time we can capture where they are and after a period of time, after the exposure to OER, integration of OER and adoption of uh, OEP, then again we can capture where they are now so we can get an understanding about the impact it has made. Uh, still uh, we, are, we are, have just piloted this so uh, I am just introducing the uh, instrument here. Uh, uh, still the whole uh, process is not over yet. Then the other important strategy we have been using is reflective practice. We have been encouraging the teachers to reflect on their practices. That's based on two models. One is Sean's reflection in action and reflection on action. That is reflecting while you are engaging in the action RIA and reflecting after you have completed an action, reflect on that. So uh, we have to maintain their reflective node during the process. And also to help their reflection, we use this framework, Rolfetel, very simple framework, framework, as they improve what, okay, what, so what, and now what. That is describing the situation they faced and examining what uh, the impact of it on them and the consequent actions. Okay, now what they are going to do it. Now this reflection series, uh, this process was very useful because uh, we Get, got them to compile all their reflections into stories. So uh, that's what happened by the end of the uh, intervention. Now we, when we come to the end of the, this went through one year. So by the end of, uh, they started uh, compiling their stories as groups. Now there were nine, nine groups. I mean, nine teachers were there. In each province, there were small groups of teachers working together, like three or four people in small teams, and compiling all their reflections together. They compile stories and motivate them. We uh, published that in a web blog. We call that Dream Weaving Open Education Pieces. I have given the web link here. Uh, you can have a look at that later. All the stories are there. Uh, uh, this was, uh, I mean, now during this uh, process, we were working with these uh, teachers uh, very closely. Uh, so this idea developed during this process because when we were collecting using all these strategies, 
these it's a huge amount of data so we thought the best way is to compile stories around all these uh, changes that have been happening so we uh, got uh, okay together us and them uh, compiled our experiences they also compiled as stories and we the researchers we also compiled our experiences and all of those things are shared in this weblog we thought we uh, call that dream weaving because okay when you go to the web see uh, we thought it's about dreams dreamers and dream weaving uh, i will let you explore it then find out more about that okay uh, the index okay about this uh, question the index uh, still we are in the validation process uh, i'm just answering one question here all right so uh, what uh, we have um, come with all these things now this is the uh, framework we have uh, come up with based on all our experiences now if i um, let me uh, go to my first start, i mean initial point now the three uh, research questions we had what is the impact of oer uh okay on three aspects the resources how teachers are using instructional resources and uh, pedagogical thinking and on their pedagogical practices now the dbr approach we use to promote and improve their practices in the use of open education resources so i i saw uh, okay uh, the definition of oep somebody was asking about the definition of op we uh, were focusing on so here i would our thinking is like that okay oer is also another educational resource now teachers are always using educational resources now uh, the it's not just uh, oer gives access to resources yes, oer gives free and open access to resources but rather than access more emphasis on our our interest is on uh, how the resources are being used by the teachers that is how they are integrating the resources in their teaching learning practices so that's what we call open practices now this okay now op this open concept has been there even before oer there has been so many open concepts like open learning open education open universities and open source software so oer also came at one point the Uh, the uniqueness is oer had this uh, concept of four hours or now you are given permission to do certain um, things which you are unable to do with the copyrighted material using this creative commons license the practitioners or the teachers in this case we are talking about teachers they were empowered to do certain things which they were not able to do before that is we using the resources in more creative and innovative way without being worried about this legal uh, or uh, the limitations so the oep we, we are thinking this change of practices for this use of resources in more innovative and creative and collaborative ways is enhancing their open practices but it won't just happen that means just giving access to oer uh, we can't expect that practices would just change suddenly so that's why we thought of helping the or promoting this to happen through designing a particular series of actions so that's what we tried doing here using the design based research approach 
design a uh, very uh, careful design of a series of actions to support and promote teachers to integrate oer and adopt oep so by now we have come up with this framework uh, we are now here there are several aspects the three things we have been focusing on the three aspects and the four stages of the dbr cycle analysis where we started by reflecting on the current practices together with the teachers and then we realized what are the issues they are facing in terms of these three aspects and as a solution we designed this intervention in collaboration with them the intervention in terms of the series of capacity building workshop and the online learning online environment in the lms and this was done several cycles is testing and refinement and finally we have come up to this reflection stage where we have compiled our stories and sharing with everybody so this is the process we have gone through uh, as co participants in this dbr project and we believe this oep has shifted from a very simple or basic level to a higher level by now but it keeps on it it's a pro, uh, it's progressing and uh, the resource use is based on this 5r we are they are using resources in all these five ways retaining reuse revise remix and redistributing because we can see they are doing all these things now earlier they were just mostly reusing but now they have come up to the revising remixing and even creating oer and distributing it among other teachers and students as well so that's a change in practice and it's not done individually it's done in a collaborative manner in groups of teachers they are sharing with each other and also uh, they are becoming very critical in selecting the oer which are very relevant to them and be creative about the ways they are using it uh, and uh, challenging that now this has started as a very challenging process so we i am trying to see the five i am trying to show you the five c's we have come up with contextual that is in relation to their context and challenging because it was a novel concept it became it uh, started as a challenge to them but they faced the challenge and now they have moved through the process of becoming more critical in selection and use of the resources and becoming more creative and collaborative in their practices so that's uh, we have come up with this framework now as uh, an overall uh, uh, approach we have taken in our research okay uh, i think um, <laughs> i have taken more time <laughs> Uh, that's uh, I, i would like to stop there and maybe answer a uh, few uh, questions if you they might like to ask ask thank you thank you excellent thank you thank you so much um 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 i i I've, i've got lots of comments but we don't we basically have around 10 minutes left and i'm going to i'm going to um I'm going to let I'm going to let you answer some of the the questions that have come up on the on the on the chat. So I think the first one um was uh Robert. Uh Sorry. There's a question from Robert. Ah oh, yeah. On the chat. Yeah, and says a problem a problem I often hear from teachers when searching for OER is the difficulty to find the right resources facing their learning objectives and taking into the into regard the right pre-knowledge so he asks did, did your teachers also experience um these problems and if so how did they solve them okay uh, 
can I see the question here? Is it typed here or? Yeah, if you scroll, you can scroll up the, the chat, you'll see Robert's question. But what I can do is I actually copy and paste it again. So yeah, 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 yeah. Can you say anything yeah. in a second? Yeah, wait. Okay, when searching for OER, it's difficult to find the right resource. Is that one? Fitting their learning objectives. Okay, I saw, I, I got it. Yeah, actually, as I mentioned, uh, they had, initially they had the problem, spe especially for certain subjects. For example, now uh, for science teachers, I teachers, they found lot of resources matching their learning objectives. But uh, for in certain subjects, they found it difficult to find uh, resources and also to fit their learning objectives. So what uh, that yeah that was a common issue faced by many teachers. Uh, they mentioned that. But what as a solution, what they try to do to create their own OER. Now I can give you one example like uh, now Sinhala language teaching. Now there were teachers who were teaching the local languages. Now there are no OER for that because this language is only uh, we are I mean. In Sri Lanka only we are using a single language. So then some teachers were motivated to create OER to match with the learning objectives and share with others. And also for Buddhism. Actually there were some priests in our uh, Buddhist monks in our, who are teachers in our some few uh, of them. So they were interested in finding uh, OER related to Buddhism and then translate them or, or I mean you uh, revise, remix uh, to adapt them according to their learning objectives and try to integrate them. So by the end of the intervention, not all, but there were some teachers who came up to that extent. Uh, I hope I uh, answered that question. Yes, I mean, yes, <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I think you did answer it. Let's, let me see, unless Robert says that he's not with that. So let me see if there's any other questions. Um, we did talk about the definition of OE, of OEP. Um, is there any more questions coming from anyone? Um, uh, I think Lisa some, asks, can you see Lisa's some questions question? I already answered. So, uh, while uh, I saw some questions, so, uh, at some points I answered certain questions, I remember. Because the index, uh, we are still in the validation point, so I can't give a reference to more about the index. Uh, and about OEP, uh, actually uh, I have, we have based it on the OPAL, definition of the OPAL project. There was a framework uh, in the OPAL project, so we started with that. And there were others, there are several definitions, but I think I mentioned how we think about OEP. I explained that uh, using our framework. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let me let me pose again, uh, this was Lisa's question. Uh, so Lisa, Lisa asked earlier on, at what extent did students adapt and upload their own OERs in approximately what percentage do you, do you have? A um, sorry, I could uh, follow that. Uh, it was not clear to me. Um, you can you can read. It's again the last question on the on the chat. So it's it's actually coming from me, but it was Lisa who asked the question first. She says, to what extent? Did students oh. adapt and upload oh, okay. students you mean the children uh, school children we didn't uh, check on that now we were dealing we were uh, the teacher student teachers you mean uh, okay the num number wise okay <laughs> okay we started with 230 teachers but actually the number dropped because there were a lot of challenges. I wanted to talk a little bit about challenges I mentioned because language was a problem for many. 
so uh, these numbers uh, gradually drop uh, well i don't have this uh, actually the percentages just now with me but it it was uh, not uh, much out of the 230 about uh, okay i can say about 40% or 30% 40% who were there by the end of it so they have they were trying to at least reuse oh yeah because uh, i want to mention we also had a competition to motivate them we had a competition within the lms uh, to see the most active teacher who is using oer uploading and sharing that's just to motivate them so uh, well since it's a very novel thing with all the challenges and technology is a challenge as well they don't have internet content connectivity in most of the schools and even if they have they are not allowed i mean they don't have uh, the permission to use you know when there are other subject teachers only the it teachers usually have access to internet so there were a lot of questions some of these teachers took their own laptops to school and used their dongles uh, and uh, did all these activities with their students so uh, the thing is with all these challenges we were very happy group of teachers who kept on doing the uh, these things because they were interested in this concept and trying to make use of that this is very challenging with all these issues so the numbers that's why we went for this qualitative more qualitative uh, aspect of it rather than looking at the numbers and if, yes. if i if i can add something is one of the things that i find most striking is the fact that it doesn't matter whether it is that we are talking about teachers or student teachers in sri lanka or we are teaching you know like i've done um, a certain amount of research uh, basically around the same topic in in scotland and teachers in scotland we still find exactly the same issues around you know concerns about quality quality of the resources or concerns about the the um, the ownership of the resources and 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 the lack of awareness so i'm going to i'm going to take one last question i'm going to paste it again it was a question from um Catherine from Catherine Cronin so this is i'm just copying and pasting it as the last question on the on the chat um so Catherine says you mentioned that one of the barriers for teachers was identity issues identity issues we have to use no okay when you uh, talk about identity issues uh, that is at the original stage uh, only about the okay quality and uh, is that uh, identity issues what do you mean by that let's see Catherine is right in okay yeah efficacy of the resources yes originally they were worried about okay the resources whether they would be uh, useful for them there were concerns about using resources developed by others but by the end of the project they were very freely uh, sharing the resources among each other those who kept until uh, waited until the uh, end of the intervention actually they were not only sharing within that small group uh, for example in certain centers they created oer and they were sharing it with the other teachers who were not involved in the intervention as well so, um, i think they are original that concerns about uh, uh, identity or the quality uh, i think when they uh, but to know that they are empowered to use them in the ways they, they would like to do i think that's the shift that has happened that that uh, knowing that they could do these things with permission empowered them to use them in more creative ways so i think that's the change we could see okay Thank you very much. Um, it's already it's it's five o'clock here in the UK. It's actually much 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 later in Sri Lanka. So this is where where we're gonna leave it. So again, Tony.
fabulous presentation. Thank you so much. This is all very interesting, very, very interesting stuff. So what I'm going to do, uh, so you know this, this has been recorded. Um, I will share a link also to Shironika's slides. So there's a lot of stuff that, that for us to, to, to follow up on. And um, but if you if you if you can't wait until I share the until we share the, the link to the slides, go and visit the um, Chironika's uh, page on the Roar for D project. It's, it's one of the impact studies, and there we we'll find links that will actually point you in the direction of reading more about the, the research that um, that she's conducted. So. Thank you uh, very much. I think uh, this is like a big round of applause, even if these guys can't actually say anything because <laughs> we've muted them. Um, so thank you, thank you so much again. Um, we'll we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can contact me uh, through my email address. It's given there. So please uh, be, uh, feel free to contact me for any. I, I'm very happy to uh, contact. I mean, share any other things you might like. To. Thank you very much for giving uh, me this opportunity to share our uh, research. Thank you, honestly. It's been, it's a, I mean, I, I'm kind of thinking we should have webinars that last two hours, I suppose. Uh, maybe you are not so happy about that, but uh, it's, uh, it's been great. So thank you, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for, for coming. I'll, we'll see you next, uh, we'll see you in four Wednesdays, hopefully. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.